you very much uh, for the opportunity to share our work. Uh, uh, it's a it's a great pleasure uh, to to be able to uh, to speak with your uh, group today about our work to improve the possibility for safe passage of fish through conventional hydropower turbines, uh, a vision that we call fish inclusion for hydropower. So first, who is Natel? Our company is a, a small company based in the United States. Uh, we have two lines of business. One uh, uh, operating under Natel Energy is in the design of fish safe turbines. And our sister company, Upstream Tech, is a leader in modern water inflow forecasting for, uh, for large hydropower fleet operators using machine learning uh, techniques uh, to provide best in class uh, 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 uncertainty quantified water inflow forecasts. Our inspiration comes from nature itself. Uh, this is uh, Beaver. Uh, beavers are nature's engineer. Um, and in addition to being MIT's mascot, beavers have a personal significance for me. Uh, when I was a, a high school student, uh, and actually for, for a lot of my childhood, my family uh, spent summers in the mountains of Colorado in the headwaters of the Rio Grande. And we had firsthand experience with the positive effects that beavers can have on stream ecology. Uh, the picture on the right shows uh, me and my sister with a Hess sampler uh, counting bugs uh, in a stream. Uh, this was part of a project uh, for which I applied uh, uh, for a grant from the University of Texas to study and quantify the health of two hydraulically similar forks of Siguach Creek. Uh, one fork ran through wilderness territory in which there were plenty of beaver activity along the stream. And then the other fork ran through multi-use lands where cattle ranchers would sometimes destroy the beaver dams, thinking that the beavers would flood uh, meadows rather than actually being important in the creation of meadows. Anyhow, this was uh, a really interesting initial uh, look into the possibility that infrastructure and streams could actually help to improve uh, the functioning of the ecosystem. In this case, uh, the quantity of beneficial insects such as mayflies, catus flies, and stoneflies was higher uh, in the reach that had healthy beaver activity versus the reach that did not. Um, and on the left is, uh, is another big inspiration is my, my dad, uh, Dr. Schneider, who had been a pilot and a sailor and had been fascinated by ways of improving sustainability of hydropower uh, for, for many, many years. So recently in the United States, beavers have achieved a level of popular media fame. Uh, California and the American West has been experiencing a period of, of extreme drought and in some cases where beavers have been reintroduced to the landscape, the riparian zones around those beaver dams uh, was literally some of the only green area left in the landscape um, as the rest of the landscape was scorched by, by um, record-breaking wildfires. So all of this is to sort of show a little bit of the context behind how we approach engineering. Um, at Natel, we, we really do take inspiration from, from these examples and, and work hard to find ways to, to, to improve the sustainability of our energy generating infrastructure. So shifting gears a little bit, uh, one of the drivers of, of hydropower regulation in the United States um, and increasingly in Europe um, are endangered species um, or threatened species like the American eel in this case. So it was a big surprise to me, even as a as an avid fisherman, to learn that American eel are or are historically were present in almost every water body that touches the Atlantic Ocean, and this represents uh, about a third of the United States generating capacity. Um, hundreds and hundreds of, of different hydropower facilities, which are illustrated by these purple dots, uh, lie in coincidence with the range of eel. And as you can see from the density of, of the dot cluster in the Northeast region of the United States, quite a lot of these projects are fairly small. And this is a problem because eels need to migrate downstream as large animals, um, uh, which is fairly incompatible with, with fast spinning um, small hydropower turbines of conventional design. In the US, 
Uh, there's also a coincident trend, uh, which is that a, a large amount of our hydropower fleet is up for relicensing in, in the near future. Uh, in the coming 10 or 15 years, uh, more than three gigawatts of hydropower uh, habitat, uh, of hydropower is, is up for relicensing on eel habitat. Um, this is nearly 250 plants. This is more than 70% of the, of the plants that are up for relicensing lie on eel territory. And also another major trend in the US is that our, our fleet is, is not getting any younger. Our average age is over 60 years um, in, in the United States. And, and this means that a lot of plants are already being considered for significant mechanical maintenance uh, just to keep running. And this really represents an opportunity uh, as the science of fish safety improves uh, to, to handle two major problems uh, with potentially one solution. And that is the, the modernization of our aging infrastructure um, while simultaneously significantly improving uh, safe fish passage through hydropower plants. So the situation is somewhat similar in Europe um, where the average age of, of hydropower facilities is, is also uh, quite old um, and uh, modernization and uh, permitting both represent an opportunity to implement best practices for downstream passage at hydropower plants. And simultaneously, in both, um, both of these regions, the populations of migratory fish like European eel and American eel have crashed since the 1980s. Um, and in Europe, the, the majority of European hydropower um, exists on, on streams or rivers that are uh, the native habitat of migratory fish species. So shifting back uh, for a minute to North America. Yeah, um, last fall, we had the opportunity to attend a meeting of Anglid eel researchers on the St. Lawrence River, which um, forms the border of the United States and Canada. And um, for, for those of you who aren't familiar, this particular region is very, this river is very far north, and it's extremely significant for the overall population of American eel. Um, all eels that, um, that mature in this watershed are female and are extremely large and are responsible for an oversized um, fraction of the reproduction for the species. Um, however, this river has several large hydropower plants on it. And there's very clear evidence of, um, of the mortality occurring from turbine passage for these eels. Um, and, and as a result, we've seen a 99% decline of the population of eels in that watershed. Um, so this is a look at um, what's found downstream of a dam in, um, in Maine, in the Northeast US. And what we're looking at here are um, a couple of American eels and several um, juvenile alewives. These are both really important migratory species that have uh, not fared well passing through conventional hydropower facilities. And they're also have been the focus of some of our fish passage research. Um, so, so the schematic on the left here is a simplified example of a conventional hydropower site that uses turbines that are not safe for fish. And when turbines are not safe for fish, it's, it's a real problem because the flow needs to be separated to what is appropriate for fish and what can be used for generation. And that creates an inherent conflict between hydropower generation goals and fish protection. Um, so the fish can, can find their way around the screen um, and make their way downstream that way, but that may be a very small fraction of the flow, or they may become impinged upon the screen or manage to pass through the screen and face uh, potential injury risk passing through the turbines. And as we've said with eels, eels are especially, um, are especially susceptible here because they're able to pass through screens despite being fairly large and face unique risks when they pass through turbines. Um, this is just a quick look at some um, really interesting research that's been coming out of Germany that shows that even even if we can exclude large fish, most fish within river systems are small and are able to pass through turbines. And so if we really want to provide a solution that can protect a wide variety of species of fish, then we need to be focused on improving turbine passage. Um, so this is an, an idealized view of what could happen if we had turbines that are truly safe for fish. Um, 
this, you know, in contrast to fish exclusion, exclusion screens is, is a concept that we call fish inclusion. And here, um, enabled by the fish safe turbines, fish are able to use all or nearly all of the downstream passing flow as viable ways to get downstream. So this improves the situation for the fish, it simplifies the operation of the site and the ability to meet both um, energy production and fishery management goals. Um, so just to, to, um, to make sure we're on the same page, um, when we talk about fish safe, there's been terms like fish friendly that have been thrown around that aren't very well defined. Um, but what we mean is that the effect of the hydropower is negligible compared to natural hazards that fish might experience otherwise. Um, and so it's something that's both species specific and watershed specific. Um, but just to give an example, if you have a river that has 10 uh, plants in series and fish need to pass through all 10 plants to complete their migration, then a survival rate of 99.5% per plant would result in a 95% population survival rate. And so true fish safety can be an extremely high bar. So Natel is, is by far not the first company to, or group of people to, to think about the idea of fish friendly or fish safe turbines. Um, and we're really building upon decades of work by others in this space. However, the majority of turbines that have been deployed uh, con that are considered safe for fish tend to be turbine types that don't represent a real scalable vision for the existing hydropower fleet. So for example, the types of turbines shown on this page, uh, on the left, a, a, a very low head modified Kaplan, and on the right, an Archimedes crew are really fantastic ideas. Um, they are very clever. Uh, and, and quite applicable within a very narrow niche of applicable sites. Um, but because of this very specific civil works that they require, because of their limited head and limited power output, um, you know, oftentimes less than a couple of megawatts per turbine and restricted to deployment at, at less than six meters or so of head, uh, they really don't represent a scalable uh, op option for, for hydropower fleet owners. Instead, uh, we really need to find ways to improve the fish safety of conventional turbines, um, such as Kaplan or propeller turbines and their variants or Francis turbines, which produce the majority of hydropower um, and hydropower energy today. So one of the issues with these types of turbines, um, especially at the, at the low head that, that um, propeller or Kaplan turbines are deployed at, uh, is mechanical strike uh, or impingement between parts that are moving and parts that are stationary um, within the turbine. And in this area, there's already been quite a lot of basic research done that helps to, to, uh, to eliminate the path forward in terms of turbine design for fish safety. For example, 10 years ago, Alden Research Lab in conjunction with the Electric Power Research Institute in the United States performed a series of tests that demonstrated the, the significance of what's called the L to T ratio or the fish body length to blade thickness ratio in improving strike survivability. These images show screenshots taken from 1,000 frame per second high speed video um, of rainbow trout that are uh, held in place and struck by a moving blade um, on the top, uh, a thin blade striking the, the trout, and on the bottom, um, a blade with about the same uh, blade thickness as the fish's body length. And a couple of really interesting things can be seen from this. If you look closely at the, the top set of images, the, the, the fish body shows no real indication of the approaching blade until it's physically struck. Um, and then the body is, is pretty violently bent um, around the leading edge of the blade. And, and uh, many of these fish, 50% of the fish in this case, die from spinal fracture. But when the same fish is struck by a, a blade that's about the same thickness as the fish is long, you can see that prior to any sort of physical contact, um, the fish's body has been forced to conform to the geometry of the leading edge. Um, so that when physical contact occurs, there's not a sudden change in that shape. Um, the fish slides off to the side and 100% of the fish in this case lived. So this is a, uh, what's happening here is there is a stagnation region in front of the blade. This is present in any object moving through a fluid. But in this case, because of the size of the blade relative to the fish, that stagnation region is large enough to, to perform work on the fish body, actually decelerating the, the fish um, and uh, causing it to conform prior to impact. So this is a, a really interesting result, um, uh, but it isn't enough 
to uh, result in, in true fish safety. And I'm just gonna skip forward uh, uh, to, to explain the thesis uh, <laughs> that Natel proposed uh, to, to further increase the allowable safe speed of a, of a hydropower turbine. And the basic idea is that traumas felt by a fish upon blade strike are proportional to the normal or orthogonal component of the relative velocity and not just simply due to the relative velocity um, at any point uh, contacting the leading edge. So that's represented in these cartoons by the red vector here. And the basic idea is that if we could change the slope of the leading edge, the metal of the leading edge at the point of uh, contact, um, that we can then arbitrarily change the magnitude of this vector. And uh, this basically will go by the sign of that, of, of the slant angle. Um, if we're able to achieve, for example, a 30 degree slant angle, then we could reduce uh, the, uh, the effective component of strike velocity by about 50%. And for a turbine with a hub to tip diameter ratio of around one half, this can sort of lead first principles to a shape that has uniform uh, uh, strike trauma risk all along the leading edge. And this is the basic idea that results in this sort of uh, unique slanted shape to the leading edge. Um, so it's the combination of bluntness and slantedness, um, which is at the core of our ideas around how to design really fast moving turbines, very compact um, turbines that have uh, effectively the same specific speed as a conventional turbine, but are yet safe uh, for fish to contact. So we tested this approach um, back at the same research laboratory uh, that had published those original results 10 years ago. Yeah, and so we, we conducted this work in parallel with the development of our first RHT. But we wanted to understand um, how do how does strike speed, um, blade thickness relative to fish length, and the angle of the blade at which the fish comes into contact with it, how does that affect survival rate? And so um, over the course of this study, we conducted 1,700 rainbow trout strikes. What you're looking at in the image here is a, is a, um, a linear flume. So it's a large tank filled with water and it has rails that you can attach different blade geometries to and use those to, um, to, to strike a fish and capture the strike event with high-speed video. Um, and so through the course of this work, we found um, that our hypothesis was validated that you can have better survival outcomes when you have um, a steep blade slant and when the size of the fish is relatively small relative to the size of the blade. And in addition to that, we collected some really important high-speed um, video footage, which allowed us to inform our own design processes. So this slide just shows a really important finding kind of in line with your intuition, but um, when the fish is small, so L to T ratios of, of one or less, then the actual velocity at which the strike occurs is reduced because that fish is, is moved short to be closer to the speed of the blade. So the strike speed is lower. Um, and this is a really important effect. Yeah. So this is uh, uh, one of the outcomes of this study uh, is that we were able to, in CFD, in computational fluid dynamics code, we were able to simulate every one of the thousands of strikes that we performed and calibrate the response of digital fish particles uh, with the dose response data uh, that was gathered from this test. And that is um, an underlying method that has then allowed us to integrate a quantitative assessment of fish safety for arbitrary blade geometries directly into the engineering process for all runners that we design today. So the outcome of this work um, are blade shapes that uh, look uh, clearly different and yet are recognizably similar to conventional turbine blades. On the top we have, uh, uh, on, on the right side of this slide, um, in this animation, you can see a conventional propeller turbine runner on the bottom compared to a restoration turbine runner on the top. Um, oftentimes, um, the same uh, specific speed uh, will be attainable with uh, a slightly lower number of blades. Um, the remaining blades are much, much thicker on the order of 10 times thicker. Um, the leading edges are slanted forward um, in a way that allows for safe strikes all along the leading edge of the blades. So this is, a, this is a concept for the design of runners. I think that's a really important point to, to understand is that uh, we're not, uh, we haven't created a, a, a single turbine with a capital T. 
It's actually a method to create turbines, um, which is important in hydropower. This is uh, how hydropower is used uh, to dealing with the idea of runner design um, as uh, different sites have different head, uh, different generators have different fixed RPMs. Um, uh, sometimes runners are set with a certain distance above tailwater. All of these different factors uh, have to be taken together into the design of a runner that is appropriate for a site. Um, and uh, our approach uh, allows for incorporation of those traditional design constraints alongside the new constraint of fish safety. This slide shows uh, how a restoration hydro turbine runner can interface with the other components of a typical turbine. But keep in mind, this is just one of many, many different um, configurations that is possible um, with an axial flow runner. Uh, in this case, we're showing a pure axial flow turbine uh, with a pit style configuration. Um, and it's really important to see that as the, the runner interfaces with its discharge ring or with the housing, there's no place uh, where fish can be pinched, um, which is really, really important, especially for elongate fish like eels. Uh, which normally can get trapped into the, the, the rearward uh, uh, curving parts of a Kaplan turbine, for example. So at this point in time, there are three different turbines using the RHT runner concept um, in operation, two in the United States and one recently uh, commissioned in Austria. Um, all of these units are uh, fairly small, um, although the, uh, the, the trajectory of our design is towards much, much larger units. Um, with turbine with runner diameters over four meters and with power outputs exceeding 20 to 25 megawatts per runner. Each of these uh, existing reference installations has also had fish passage tests performed. Well, I should say uh, uh, each of the American sites has had fish passage tests performed. Um, this, this slide shows uh, some images from the Oregon uh, project. The Monroe Drop project has uh, five meters of head. The turbine uh, outputs 300 kilowatts. It's a direct drive uh, turbine with a variable speed PMG. Um, and this is a project where multiple fish passage tests have been performed in conjunction with the Pacific Northwest National Lab on rainbow trout, ranging from 20 uh, all the way up to past 50 centimeters uh, over the course of, of our tests. And in these uh, different tests, we've been able to, uh, uh, to basically uh, validate 100% control corrected survival of of all uh, of the fish tested. And importantly, uh, no indications of descaling or, or any evidence uh, of turbine passage um, in comparison to the, to the condition of the control fish. You can also see from, from this uh, bottom left video, um, uh, a video of, of one of the fish passing through. The yellow balloons are uh, high Z tags or balloon tags, uh, which are used for recovery of these large fish. Um, and this sort of is a constant theme of our fish testing, which is we always seek to collect high speed video or direct video observation of passage through the turbines. Um, this is a, a set of images from the turbine most recently installed in Austria. Uh, this is a two bladed design uh, in a uh, fully integrated submersible turbine um, form. Um, and I just wanna point out uh, that this is direct evidence of the idea of uh, a design approach for fish safety as opposed to a single runner design. In this case, this is a turbine of only 62 centimeters runner diameter, um, but it's intended to allow for quite large uh, local fish to pass through by reducing the number of blades to only two. The remaining blades uh, uh, thickness uh, is, is very, very large um, and a huge amount of space is, is available for fish to pass through the turbine. But for much larger runner diameters, uh, the number of blades can increase, um, as you will see in some later slides. So next we wanted to walk through uh, some of our fish passage tests, both um, in the lab and in the field at small and at large scale. Yeah, so we've conducted several different tests with different species, um, and this is for a few reasons, um, to help inform our own designs to make truly fish safe turbines and also to get the information out um, to people who need to see it when they're making decisions around hydropower and fish. Um, so all of our studies have, have involved um, the feedback of uh, regulators in the US and other groups with um, expert knowledge on fish passage so we can design them to answer the right questions um, and look at things beyond just direct survival. Um, but 
these are a few of the primary species that we've tested to date, all representative of different um, morphologies. We've done extensive work with rainbow trout as an initial species to work with, but then um, we've also conducted a, uh, a test with American eel and a test with juvenile alewe alewife, which are a representative, very fragile um, allocene species, representative of, um, of shads and river herrings. And all of these tests have shown um, remarkably high survival. So we'll get into a few of them. Um, this is a look at our in-house scale uh, passage testing facility. So this is located just uh, behind us um, here in California. And um, it was originally constructed to allow us to perform conventional um, performance tests of efficiency, power, flow, things like that um, to characterize the turbine but we added a few features to allow us to also test fish passage. Um, so if we follow the arrows here, um, this is a, a pipeline that allows continuous recirculation of flow. Um, and the, the turbine is located up on this platform here. It has a transparent runner housing, which allows us to capture video of fish or passing through the turbine or anything else that we wanna see. Um, just upstream of that is our injector. So this allows us to load fish into a canister, bring it up to pressure, and then release them into the pipeline. From there, they flow downstream, um, pass through the turbine, and then are extracted from the flow by a, an inclined wedge wire screen, and then can be recaptured in the circular tank um, shown here. And, and the entire amount of time um, from the moment the fish are injected to when they're recaptured in the tank is around eight seconds. So we're able to collect really immediate observations of their condition. Um, and our most comprehensive study to date that we've conducted with this facility was with American eel. Um, back in 2021, we conducted this test with, um, with a group of scientists from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And we designed this study to, to try to cover as broadly as we could um, the applicable range of information. So we wanted to understand how do eels pass through turbines? That's something that really wasn't known um, because of the lack of ability to look inside and see what's happening. Um, we want to study as large of eels as we could uh, relative to the size of a turbine. So really notably that this test unit is 55 centimeters in diameter, but the size of the eels that we tested was all the way up to 65 and a half centimeters in length. Um, and then we wanted to collect observations of their condition um, over the course of the study as well, in addition to survival directly. Um, so this is a look at the, the size of the turbine that we were working with here. Um, if we take that 55 centimeter turbine and we scale it up to say 1.9 meters in diameter, which is the size of, of one of our sites here in the US, um, then the size of the eels actually scaled up exceeds the maximum length of American or European eels. And so the test that we designed was actually fairly conservative in this respect. Um, so I'll just walk through a few of the steps of the testing process here. Um, every single eel was was pit tagged so we could track it over the course of the study, um, also uh, measured for length and weight. And then um, prior to turbine passage, as well as um, after turbine passage and after a 48 hour hold period, each eel was assessed for its um, external condition and was also placed in this um, swim tubs to allow us to capture footage of their swimming behavior. So um, after the initial assessment, the eel was um, transported to the injection location on the test loop, um, loaded into the canister, and then released to the turbine and recaptured downstream. At the same time, we had a team of high-speed video operators who were scrubbing through the footage and, and looking for the moment when the eel passed through the turbine. Um, and we got this process fairly uh, fairly well. Um, so we captured 89% of all of the eel passages in the study on video. And that was really important because it showed us that every single one of the eels, because they're so large relative to the small turbine, did come into contact with the blades. 
Um, so this is an example of the type of data that we collected um, for a single eel over the course of the testing. Um, and you can see how, how its uh, swimming behavior is over, over the course of that. Um, and then the next slide, I believe, is, um, is video of that same eel passing through the turbine. So we were able to draw conclusions about um, how the eel's experience with the turbine affected any aspects of its condition or behavior. Um, and this work uh, was published last year in Transactions of the American Fisheries Society. Um, so if you're interested, we encourage you to take a look at that. We were able to um, not only see 100% survival of all of the treatment and control eels, but also capture some really interesting insights on how the eels are passing through the turbines. Um, and in addition to that work, because we had all of the eels pick tagged at the end of the study, um, there, there was a subset of eels that was removed for x-ray um, and had to be euthanized for that. But the remaining eels, we actually, um, pass them through the turbine a second time under the same operating conditions. And um, this is important because we know that eels in many cases have to pass through more than one hydropower facility to make it to the ocean. Um, and so this was a really special opportunity to be able to directly look at that. And again, we saw 100% survival um, of those eels that were passed twice. So switching over to, to another study that we conducted also um, in 2021, we wanted to understand how a, an ex especially fragile uh, fish species and life stage, um, juvenile alewife, passes um, through the RHT. And we were not able to conduct this study on our test facility in California because these fish are are so delicate that they really can't be transported across the country. But fortunately, um, there is a site within RHT installed um, in, in Maine in the Northeast, and it's located very close to a large um, natural uh, run of alewives. So we designed the study to occur during that um, migration season. And um, because of some of the particularities of the site, we were able to install a transparent half runner housing um, and capture video of fish passage, as well as a, um, a wedge wire recovery trap, which allowed us to recapture 100% of the fish without, um, with minimal handling without any tagging. Um, so, so this is a closer look at that transparent housing um, and the trap with this is a look after the turbine has been shut down, so the, the water has calmed down, um, looking at all the alewives that we recaptured at the outlet, um, as well as if you look closely, there's another um, just local fish that passed through the turbine. Um, so yeah, so we captured the fish um, nearby, transported to them, them to the site, um, released them in groups of about 250 at a time through the turbine. We also had a control group, which was released into the pipeline just downstream of the turbine. Um, yeah, next slide. Um, and this is a look, um, just a, a small look at uh, what is many minutes of footage of these alewives passing through the turbine. This is, this is very much slowed down. Um, but what I really like about this video is that you can see that the alewives are are passing through the turbine in different locations and in different orientations, but in no case are they actually conforming to the leading edge of the blade and moving with it, which is what we know is representative of a severe strike from the work that we um, conducted in the laboratory. And so this is consistent with the results that we saw, which were 100% um, 48 hour control corrected survival for these fish. So in this site, in this study, one of the most exciting things about it was uh, not on the formal study plan, and that's the fact that this site is pulling water from a wild stream. And uh, during the course of the study, as Sterling mentioned earlier, we we were pulling native fishes through, um, and because the study had been set up with a, a one millimeter uh, wedge wire screen, we were able to to isolate almost everything uh, above that size. So we were, uh, over the course of the study, we, we captured a 40 centimeter eel, a 20 centimeter black bass, 
numerous crayfish or crawdads, uh, numerous suckers and perch, um, even dragonfly larvae um, and freshwater mussels uh, uh, were recovered. And all these organisms were, were uh, unharmed and released back into the stream uh, during the study. Uh, really importantly, this project has been required by its operating license or its permit to, to operate with a 19 millimeter clear space bar rack, um, which is supposed to exclude these fish and, uh, or at least the, the, the eel and the black bass, for example, um, shouldn't have been permitted to enter the turbine. And so this is just another anecdote um, showing that uh, the screens don't really keep the fish out. And uh, it may be a matter of um, deceiving ourselves to say that the screens are actually protecting the, the population if the turbines are not actually safe uh, for fish to pass through. On the flip side, this is a really exciting um, anecdotal uh, uh, data point uh, showing safe, uh, safe passage of, of many, many different species through this turbine. Um, so on that topic, uh, I wanted to bring it back to eels. Um, and uh, uh, when we look at the, at, the, at the literature in terms of other existing hydropower facilities that have had single passage tests done for eel, um, and then compare what we've achieved with our uh, tests so far um, on eel passage, what we're showing in orange is the, the small um, 55 centimeter 667 RPM turbine um, that we tested eel passage with PNNL um, and in comparison to, to all these other turbines. And as you can see, in general, uh, uh, on the X axis of this plot is the blade peripheral speed, uh, the maximum tip speed out at the max diameter of turbines. And then on the Y axis is the single passage survival rate for eels in each of these studies. The RHT has shown to date the, the highest uh, speed for perfect survival uh, of passage at, at just under 20 meters per second. Um, but it's clear that the existing fleet of conventional turbines has much higher tip speeds. And this is where Natel's design is focused now. Uh, we are working hard to, to develop uh, RHT runner designs uh, that approach the 30 or exceed 30 meter per second tip speeds. Um, and uh, we are preparing to conduct a set of different tests in the lab and in the field um, on these designs going forward, which could allow for straightforward runner retrofits of, um, of conventional machines um, out in this uh, right-hand part of the design space. So coming back uh, again, again to this idea of fish safety and why it matters, we wanted to, to show uh, mathematically why uh, fish safety matters, especially for river systems where you have numerous hydropower plants in a row. And so the, the simple math, if all of the fish needed to go through, even turbines that are normally considered to be quite uh, safe for fish, uh, such as a 93% survival rate, um, when multiplied out by, by 10 different plants passages, um, it can result in pretty severe consequences for the population. Whereas if, uh, if true fish safety is assured, uh, for all of these passages, then uh, it's possible for the entire watershed to experience relatively neutral effect on the population. So uh, where are we going uh, now with this design? I think it's, it's important to understand that what we've created is not just a turbine, it's a turbine design concept that allows for maximizing of the turbine rotation speed while still achieving fish safety. And um, when we first started with this concept um, at the end of 2018, uh, we were pretty focused on the small hydropower market um, as uh, the place where we could make the most relative difference. Um, and that's technically true, but uh, we've come to understand that the design principles um, uh, and, and manner of operation uh, do not, uh, are not limited to small turbines. Um, we're very actively now working on runner designs uh, for much, much larger uh, facilities. Um, and this is where I think uh, the greatest impact, positive benefit of these ideas uh, will ultimately be found. Um, for example, RHT runners can provide for runner only or turbine uh, replacements for existing hydropower facilities um, at sites up to and potentially exceeding 30 meters in head and largely without limit on runner diameter. Um, this could allow for modernization of existing power plants with 
very minimum um, civil works expense. Uh, for example, these runners can be designed to reuse the existing generators, um, uh, which are operating at fixed shaft speed, and to use the existing uh, water passageway, including uh, all aspects of the existing intakes, uh, wicket gates, stay vanes, uh, the draft tubes, and even in some cases, the discharge ring can be reused um, without significant modification. All of this can be done uh, without any compromise in, in peak efficiency. Um, and also the resulting shapes uh, of these uh, different runner designs um, are cost competitive and weight uh, competitive with the conventional runners that they replace. Um, so this is, I think, uh, one of the most exciting directions that we're taking uh, with, with this uh, technology uh, and could really uh, open up um, uh, a lot of exciting opportunities uh, uh, for, for cost-effective and relatively rapid improvements in environmental sustainability um, at existing hydropower facilities. So with that, I'm gonna, going to conclude. Um, and we are grateful again for the opportunity to, to meet with the group and uh, happy to, to, to go over um, any questions that you may have.